Genesis chapter 23. <clears throat> and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher, which is another word for tomb, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar. In other words, go talk to Ephron for it. That he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, I don't mean to interrupt the, the reading, but I would like you to notice how this has taken place. All this has taken place, this transaction, in the midst of an audience at the gate of the city. This is where commerce took place in the ancient east at the gates of the city. And so I want you to just know if you can picture in your mind that there's a transaction that's trying to go down here and that is being done in public in the midst of everybody out in the open. Okay. Verse 11. Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field give I thee and the cave that is therein. I give it thee in the presence of the sons of my people. Give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. Come on, Abraham. They're trying to give you something, man. Can't you take your gift from the people? They just want to give you something. Why are you being so stubborn about this situation? He spoke unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? In other words, what is that between us? Bury thy dead. Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron. And Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver current money with the merchant. <coughs> and the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field, and the cave, which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders, round about, were made sure. In other words, they made sure that everything was delineated and marked out. All these trees, this portion of the field, including the cave that's located therein, all this right here is being said in front of the whole audience that this piece of property right here is being purchased by one named Abraham, and this belongs to him now. These are the borders. The borders were made sure. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place in the sons of Heth. Father, once again, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. I pray that you, Lord, I know you've shown me some things, but I'm asking you, Lord, to show up, Lord God, and to speak in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just to get a little bit of geography, not that we need a whole lot. I'm not going to try to belabor the point, but we've, always, we've, we've been drawing this map for quite some time. 
Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, the Dead Sea. Jerusalem was somewhere around here. You're familiar with Jerusalem where the capital of Israel was with the temple and all that. And then down here is Hebron. It's about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. This is where everything's taking place. Now you got to understand that this is the ancient east. This is this is a time frame, you know, we've talked about the fall before, and then it's about 2000 BC that God calls Abraham. That's what we're talking about here, is a time frame of Abraham. It's about 1400, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip, 1440 BC for the Exodus. Y'all know what the Exodus is, right? Whenever the children of Israel come out of Egypt and God's moving them into the promised land. I'm going to put just one, two more dates. Uh, it's about, after about a 40 year wilderness wandering, about 1400 BC that they enter into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua and then basically we're used to about 33 AD which is the time frame that we talk about Jesus and what he came to do on the cross so we just try to look at all of these things in 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 you know proper perspective and once again this is where we are we're we're at the very early stages of God's salvation history right God has a plan Right. And one of the things that I keep trying to explain to people is that God's not going to change his plan or the direction that he's moving for anybody. It doesn't matter how smart man thinks he is. It doesn't matter how man thinks God ought to do things. God's not going to change his mind. The plan has been in effect since the beginning of before he ever even spoke the world into existence. The word of God says that I'm getting ahead of myself. You weren't redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold. It was a full ordained plan before the earth was ever formed before the mankind was ever spoken into existence before the dirt that you walk on was ever here God already knew that man in the garden would fall and that he had a plan of redemption I'm going to explain to you what redemption means he had a plan of redemption a buyback plan where he was going to allow man to have communion with him again already God knows the state that you're in. God knows your condition. He knows where you've been. He knows the, the journey that you've taken. He knows the failures that have taken place in your life. He knows the destruction that has happened in the midst of your life. He knows what people talk about you behind your back. He knows how the world around you views you. I'm here to tell you God has a whole different view about you. I'm here to tell you that if you would allow God to move into the midst of your corner and to go to war for you, oh, hallelujah, he's a game changer. He changes everything. And that's right, he gets glory, amen. He changes things. The God of glory with the power of his Holy Spirit moving and operating in people's lives changes things. And here we are in the early stages of this plan. Now you got to understand something that God gave Abraham a promise. You know that promise, right? Come out from amongst your father's house, Abraham. But what does that mean? He's still saying the same thing to people today. Come out of your daddy's house. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? You were born uh, the first time of your father, Adam. You were born in a family house. You were born with a particular mindset. And that mindset most times is driven by the spirit of the world. And the spirit of the world has a mindset on how they things, think things ought to go. And the word of God says, come out of your father's house, Abraham. Why? Because I'm going to make you a great nation. Hallelujah. Through that nation, ultimately, 2,000 years later, I'm going to give Jesus. Amen. And Jesus is going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And now today, he's still crying out to each and every one of us. Amen. He's crying out not just to you, somebody in here, you might not have been left your daddy's house yet. I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. Amen. You might not have left your daddy's house yet, you might still be in your first birth of Adam, but I'm here to tell you, he's going to call you today to leave your daddy's house, and once he calls you to leave your daddy's house, he doesn't want you to be quiet about it, he wants you to talk about it in the audience of all of the people of the city, he wants you to stand in the gates of the city, the word of God says, in Proverbs chapter 8, does not wisdom cry out? Wisdom, a personification of Jesus. What does that mean? It means that something that is inanimate takes upon human-like qualities. Jesus is the pre-incarnate Jesus before he became flesh, was the word of God that spoke the world into existence. And even in the book of Proverbs, he is wisdom. And he cries out at the gates of the city. He says, come unto me. Come 
Come to me, you who lack understanding. Come up to me, simple ones. I didn't write it. God wrote it. Come up to me, you fool. You think you have understanding. You're simple in mind. You don't have the understanding of God. Come up to me. I cry out at the gates of the city, at the way where the paths cross. I go where the people are to speak forth the truth and to make my way known. But yet so many people just go about their busy day not paying attention to the things of God, not worried about the word of God. And they think that they have something figured out. And the reality of it is, is that they're simple-minded. They lack understanding. Amen. They have not been enlightened. Their eyes have not been right. opened to the word of God. Why? Because they have not been born again. Amen. I was able to share just yeah, uh, Friday. I had some nursing students from Nichols that were following me around. Come to find out the girl, her daddy's a pastor of a church. The other guy, I don't know what the deal was, but the Lord opened up a door. And I just started talking about Jesus. Amen. Yes. And when it was all said and done after a little while, and I knew I had probably gone too far, but, you know, I went another mile after that. And I said, I said, dude, I don't know. I, don't, I know this girl. Her daddy's a pastor. She, she, she seems to really love the Lord. I don't know what you know about God. But I've said born again four times. And you probably don't even know what that means. I'm suggesting you look into it, dude. I'm suggesting that you look into it because you know what? You may not be the, know the first thing about it, but I'm suggesting you start asking some questions. As a matter of fact, when you go to lunch with this girl in about 20 minutes, I suggest you sit down with her and you ask her some questions. And I hope and pray that she can give you some answers because you must be born again. And the first time you're born of Adam, it ain't good enough. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care if you pay your bills on time. I don't care how pretty the car you drive is. I don't care if your clothes look cool. I don't care if your face is pretty. It ain't going to get you where you need to go. You must be born again or else you will, according to the word of God, split hell wide open. Amen. It won't be because of all the bad stuff you did. It'll be because of the one right, right thing Amen. you didn't do. You refuse to bow your knee Amen. to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, i got to be honest with you, none of that was in my introduction, but praise God, I asked God to speak, and I believe he's speaking already. But chapter 23 precedes chapter 24. And in chapter 24, Isaac, the son, is the servant, Eleazar, a representative of the Holy Spirit, goes to find Isaac, the son, a bride. Yes. He it's called the great Eliezer call. We've talked about it before in the church. This is a call that has been taking place from the beginning of time. The Holy Spirit has been calling people and bidding them or inviting them to come to the marriage of the Lamb. Even in the Old Testament, before they knew his name was going to be Yeshua or Jesus, and then he would die on a cross, which was a, tip, a typology of the Old Testament altar, before anybody knew that, that was the call. You respond to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the level that you understand and know today. And guess what? You put your faith in the shedding of the blood for your righteousness. And one day, hallelujah, the eternal lamb is going to die on the cross and he's going to fulfill the plan of God. He's going to make it all right. And so there's a calling of a bride. The question is, is that have you responded to the call? The question is, do the people that you work with, do the people that you know, have they responded to the call? The people that you run into at Walmart, I'm talking about the ones that don't smell right. If you don't smell right in here this morning, ain't none of y'all got an excuse, because guess what, I got a whole bunch of soap <laughs> that, the, that the clinic gave me, and if you need some soap, I can hook you up. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is they got people out there that don't smell good. Amen. I'm not trying to make fun of them. The Lord has already chastised me when my sister died. I can remember that. When my sister died, I was laying in the bed, crying, looking at my Christianity, realizing what a hypocrite I was. I was so full of pride. You think I'm bad now? I was bad. I was so full of pride, so full of air. I thought I was something. And, and I can remember my heart was broken. My heart was broken, man. Tragedy struck my life. You know... I'm going to say it, and I hope that the family members watch. I heard, you know, not that long ago that there were supposedly Christians, and there were some family members, and, and, and they were in the midst of a conversation. 
And they were talking about somebody's daddy who had killed himself. Hmm. And they started talking about the fact that he was, oh, what a loser. What? What a, what a loser. I mean, you're gonna, he's going to kill himself? And you know, the fact of the matter is that my sister had taken her life. It's not, I'm a big boy. God's healed me. I don't need pity. That's not the issue. But what I realized in the death of my sister was how, how rudiment, rudimentary, how elementary my way of thinking was, how I thought of myself so high and mighty and the reality of it is, is that through it all, God broke me down and he lowered me and he humbled me. And I realized that there were going to be people that were going to talk behind my back and question things. Oh, I, I listen to me. I'm just trying to make a point. What kind of Christianity is that? Mm. What kind of Christianity is that that looks down upon people who have failures in their life, who have weaknesses in their life? What kind of, what kind of Jesus is that? The one who came to heal the lepers and the unclean. The one who came to cause those that were dead to rise up and to walk again. The one who came and, and healed Mary Magdalene of the devils that were in her because she slept with every man probably in the town. But yet God delivered her and he changed her life because that's the kind of God that we serve. One who sets the captives free and gives people that had an old past a new life. I don't know what kind of Jesus you're serving this morning. But that's the Jesus that I'm living yes, for today. Thank you, Jesus. And I just think about that. People's mindsets. And they sit in churches across America. And they look down their religious nose. And they think they have something figured out. And they hadn't even first tapped into the true gospel. Because if they did, they'd realize like Isaiah the prophet in chapter 6. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. The train of his veil to fill the, the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. And the seraphim began to cry, holy, holy, holy. And the door post of the temple shook and I said woe unto me for I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and if you hadn't gotten that revelation honey I'm afraid that you might not be saved. Hallelujah. It requires humility of heart for true repentance to take place. Amen. It requires for somebody to come to the realization that woe unto me I am undone and without the intervention of God and the plan of God and the shedding of the blood of the precious one, oh Lord, help me. I'm a mess. I'm all undone. Yeah. I'm unclean, the leper would say. I'm unclean. I need you, Lord. Yes. I need you to work in the midst yes. of my life. Amen. That's the Eliezer call. Yes. He's trying to call. That's the wisdom of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Crying out at the gate. Hey, simple one. You who have no understanding, fool, won't you come unto me? Oh, I know it's harsh. Oh, preach, I don't like your personality. It's okay. They got a Bible student coming Wednesday. Show up. You'll probably like his better. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. The gospel is calling those, but he's wanting you to know you're not okay. That's right. And that's the Eliezer call. Amen. And in the midst of this chapter 23, which precedes chapter 24, we have, I titled my message, The Burial of a Bride. Sarah, the bride of Abraham. And historically, that's what we see. We see the legitimate burial of the great Abraham, the father of the faith, burying his bride. But I got to tell you that it's not just history. There's theology deep in here. And people are like, oh, man, I don't like that big old word theology. It's, don't stress. Theology. Theo, God. Ology, study. The study of God. That's what we do, right? We come here to study God. It's okay. We don't have to flip out. It's just a simple word. There's theology within this story. Amen? Truths about God. Truths about his plan. God, a master literary genius, writes things that you and I can't even imagine. We got to dig. We got to dig deep. We got to find the treasures of God. And he's trying to speak to us in here. It's a burial place for a bride. The first thing I want you to know is, is that place of the burial says right here in verse 1 of chapter 23, Sarah was 127 years old. These were the years of her life. Verse 2, Sarah died in Kirjathorba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now the first thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is that God had given Abraham a promise. He gave him a promise for a place and a people. He told him, and he said, come out of your father's house, 
I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and through your seed, we know it to be Jesus. We've gone over it a million times. That's what Paul said in Galatians 3. Not too many seeds, one seed, seed which is Christ, Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus will come through you, the Messiah, the anointed one. I'm going to make you a people, but I'm going to give you a place. This is the place that God promised Abraham. This place right here. Lying between the border of the Jordan and the western border of the Mediterranean Sea. This place previously known as Canaan. I don't know if you appreciate this or not, but I was a Christian for 12 years and never knew that Canaan was the promised land. Never knew that Canaan previously now is Israel, the nation that God gave to his people. Now, what you got to understand is, is that this is before the nations formulated. This is before I, Abraham's offspring. Isaac had a son named Jacob, Jacob, the 12 tribes. This is before they're in Egypt. This is before the Exodus. This is before Joshua's conquest, whenever they actually become the nation known as Israel. So right now, the Canaanite inhabits the land. And Abraham left the area of Ur of the Chaldees, which is, the, which is between the rivers Mesopotamia, somewhere here in southern Iraq. And he traveled over here to the land that God had promised him. You know, I'm seeing within this story so many truths. Because, first off, I'm, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but, but there's a place for this burial. The place is called Hebron. And I don't want to get ahead, but once again, I want you to, I want you to understand that, that I'm seeing that God is staking his claim upon this earth. He gave Abraham a promise, and Abraham is, is going gonna, is gonna to buy him a place. And it's a first step in the beginning of a promise. See, God's promised you some things in the word of God. Amen. He's promised you victory. He's promised you that if you'll trust him and you'll follow him, that he will restore your life. But listen to me. Some, you, at some point in time, you got to start acting on the promise. you got to start walking after and believing the promise. And all Abraham knows right now is this. God has promised me a place. And he's promised me a people. Right now the Canaanite lives in the midst of the land. But I know that the God I serve, he spoke to me. I told the kids the other night when I taught them. I, I, I talked like I was Jacob in the first person. I said, my name is Jacob. And I said, the God of glory spoke to my grandfather Abraham. Came out of nowhere. I'm talking about the God that, that created the dirt that you walk on. The God that created the food that you eat. The God that created the sky that you see, he talked to my father Abraham, my grandfather Abraham. And my grandpa believed him and started out on a journey. God, in the same thing in your life, has spoken a word to you through his word. Amen. He's asking you to believe him. Amen. And he's asking you to embark upon a journey. Amen. Now I just want to talk to you about Hebron a little bit. Amen. Hebron is where... Abraham is burying his wife Sarah, but listen to me, Hebron had a history, has a history and has a future from this time. Before this passage of scripture, Hebron is where Abraham built one of his altars. Abraham built three altars. If you remember the story between Abraham and Lot, and if you didn't, you'll need to go back and read it. Abraham and Lot, they both became very wealthy. They had too many herds. The land could not contain them. And so they each made a, Lot made a decision. Well, I just can't help pass it up when I, when, I, when I get to it. See, Abraham made a decision based on a promise. A promise connected to the word of God. Amen. God told Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham was trusting God that the God that he served was able to accomplish what he said he could. Lot, on the other hand, represents the carnal Christian, the one who views the situation. See, the Bible says that Lot looked on the plain of Jordan and saw that it was well watered. It's logical. It's well watered. The grass is green. I'm a shepherd. So therefore, I take this area here. But the problem is, is that that area was near Sodom. Hmm. Sodom is the world. Lot pitched his tent towards the world. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, he's in the midst of the world. And how many times do Christians make decisions based upon what looks good to their Amen. physical eyes instead of asking God, Lord, reveal your will for my life in the midst of your overall promise yes. that I might walk according to your will. Amen. Amen. But the point is, is that after Abraham got done with that situation with Lot, he built him an altar. 
See, an altar is the Old Testament cross. Mm -hmm. Amen? And, and not only did he build an altar, but he buried his bride in Hebron. So he built an altar, death, and he made a burial place being buried. And that's what you do with dead things. You bury them. You bury them, and he says in multiple occasions in this story that I might hide my dead from me. Mm -hmm. See, the Word of God teaches that, listen, whenever something's dead, you're supposed to bury it, and you're supposed to hide it away. And, and, and it's a bride that he's buried. And one of the things that I started thinking of in modern day marriage, you come to an altar. You come to an altar where two people are supposed to die and become one. And they become one flesh at the altar. And then, and then even in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, the altar is the cross. And the believer is to come to the cross, die to self, and become one with Jesus. Romans 7, 4 says, you're supposed to be married to another, even him who was raised from the dead. You and I, as the bride of Christ, are supposed to be married to Jesus, and we come to an altar called the cross, where the old man born of Adam dies, and we come into union with God. Oh, hallelujah. The altar kills things, the tomb buries things. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 says... Did you not know that those of us who were baptized into Christ, not talking about water, but faith. Faith puts you in Jesus and in the mind of God you die with him and buried with him. Amen. The old man born of Adam buried in a tomb to be forgotten and let him, his decaying corpse continue to rot in another place. Amen. And that the new man born of Christ with resurrection power, would be alive. So Hebron represents a place of death. It represents a place of burial. But I want you to know it also represents a place of victory. According to Joshua tap, chapter 10, see, now we're moving into the promise. First, there's a promise given to Abraham. I'm going to make you a people. The people become slaves in Egypt. They come out of the exodus, and now they enter into the promised land, which represents the victory that God has for you. I want you to know that there's victory according to the gospel. It doesn't matter. It does matter, but listen to me. Just because you may not be experiencing the victory of God in your life, even if the preacher doesn't experience victory of God in his life, and there is... The word of God is clear. Jesus purchased victory. The gospel works in him, and we have to learn how to trust it, put faith in it, and hold on to it Amen. each and every day until we see it manifest in the midst of our lives. Abraham was given a promise, and he continued to walk, even though what he saw with his physical yes. eyes did not meet up with the promise that God had given him. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, you need to hold on to the promise of God. Right. You need to hold on to the victory of God. Right. In Joshua chapter 10, the children of God move into Hebron and they destroy the king there and the people there. I need you to understand something. Mm -hmm. Hebron also represents a place of victory. Mm -hmm. When I was thinking about victory, I, I thought about one of the names of the Lord. If you have your Bible, I'm going to get you to turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 because it's one of those verses that I kind of really just want you to see. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. I was thinking of victory and I thought about one of the names of the Lord. Jehovah Nisi. He's our banner. It says right here in First Chronicles 29, 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven. And in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. See that word victory right there in the Hebrew language is Nisi. That's where we get our word Nisi from. It's Jehovah Nisi, God the banner. The banner is, the way it's described in the original language is that it's that bright object that is looms ahead in the far distance, but that you can see it. With your eyes. I don't know if you've ever run in a race before. Sometimes I'll put one of the big old flags, a big banner at the end to give you some hope whenever you suck in there and you don't think you're going to make it to the end. There it is, right there. There's the finish line. But this is different because this is a banner of war. And, and, it's, and it represents the rallying place. It represents the place that you run to, that you rally to, and that you prepare yourself whenever you're ready to enter into war. It's the victory place. 
I'm here to tell you that victory took place at Hebron, and it has to take place, and a death and a burial, and from that result, there comes resurrection power, resurrection life, the victory of God. He's Jehovah Nisi. He is our banner. He's the rallying point. He's the place that we come together and we find the strength that we need in order to be the people of God that he's called us to be. Amen. Oh, amen. Now, i got to tell you something. Since I've been teaching the Bible, I used to go to another church. And what they kept tried to hem me in to was that I taught the addiction class. Remember that, Robert? Yeah. That was all we ever were. And, we, we were, and, I, and I, can remember, I can remember talking to the preachers. I was like, dude, you need to come to the class. That's why they don't like me. You need to come to the class because it's not the addiction class. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why in the world did we go to the same Bible college? Why in the world did we work on the same degree? And why in the world can we not see that this is the gospel that changes people's lives? Whether you're a whoremonger, a drunkard, an addict, a liar, a gossiper, whatever it is that you have on the inside of you, why can you not see that this is the gospel that changes people's lives? Right, and here a while back somebody told me, man, dude, your church is full of addicts. <laughs> and yeah, you're, you were an addict. They probably say, yeah, you were a fornicator. And at first, you know, it's kind of like I get a little bit heavy because I'm reminded back into the old days. Man, they're just still trying to hem me in. And then next thing you know, I saw that banner out on the horizon. A big old bright object that says, this is a rallying point, Matt. This is the place that people's lives are changed. Oh man, a couple of days later, I was like, woo! Hallelujah! Church is full of people that used to be jacked up. Church is full of people that used to be broken and crippled. Church is full of people that was sick on the inside and couldn't get free. And then Jesus showed up. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And he moved into their hearts and he began to restore their lives. Come unto me, you who are simple and lacking understanding. Fool, come unto me and hear the wisdom of the Lord. Amen. The wisdom of the Lord says, I make all things new. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know if you're willing to believe a preacher like that. I don't know if you're willing to believe in a God like that. That shows up when people are dead and broken and brings resurrection life. Changes things. Oh, but I never had that problem, preacher. I never did drugs. I never got drunk and fell on my face. I was never a whoremonger. In other words, I never fornicated. I never slept with anybody outside of marriage. Come on, somebody. Give me a break. Did you think about it? What did you do in the back room when the door was closed? All running out of breath. Amen. Woo! Amen. What did you do in the back room when the door was closed? Preach it. Come on, somebody. Amen. Oh, well, I didn't fornicate. Yo, what did you do in your mind? Because, see, when you've done it in your mind, you just shouldn't have done it. Don't come up to amen, brother. Don't come up in here all holy thinking, oh, I hadn't done what they done. That's, you know what that's called? I've tried to teach you for a long time. I know people are listening to me. Relative righteousness. It means in relation to what you've done, I'm good. Sorry. In relation to what you've done, I'm good. Oh, come on, come on, David. Don't forget where you came from, bro. I'm not going to tell everybody. Oh, but David, I'm a nurse practitioner now. You know, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, let me sit down with the doctors and have a glass of wine. I have arrived to a certain level. You know what? Take your church full of nurse practitioners, lawyers and doctors, and pharmacists if they got the wrong idea. And give me a church full of people that are broken. Oh, come on, somebody. Full of people that are broken. Deep down. that Jesus came for. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. Jesus said, I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick. Hallelujah. He was talking to the Pharisees. Oh, they thought that they were well. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus knows everything. Amen. He knows you ain't well. Thank you. He's saying, you think you know you're well. Amen. You think that you're okay. I didn't come for you. I didn't come for you. And until your mindset changes... And you learn how to get lowliness of mind. Amen. I still didn't come for you. Oh. Because you got to receive me. I'm the physician. Mm -hmm. I'm the bulb of Gilead. I come to put some medicine on you. 
because you're sick. I'm Jehovah Rapha. I will heal you. But you got to let me heal you. Come on, somebody. Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't start looking around at the people around you and looking down on them, thinking that you got something better than them. Because I'm telling you right now, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, you who were all beat down, broke down, and busted and disgusted, and you think that God can't fix your life. Hold on to Jesus now. Just let me tell you something. Because it don't matter. I might not even want to see the victory. You know what? The preacher's still the heart still ain't right sometimes. Sometimes the preacher might not. The wrong motives in his heart. There's going to be people around you. They don't even want to see you succeed. At least whenever the preacher gets in the presence of God, the Lord begins to chastise him and shows him, your heart's all wrong. You need to seek my face, and this is the way that you need to pray. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's going to be people that don't want to see you rise up. All they ever going to say is, is that this is who you were. They don't know nothing about Jehovah Nisi the banner. They don't know nothing about the rallying point. They know nothing about that bright object that looms in the distance that's crying and screaming, come unto me and bow your knee and I will give you victory. They don't know anything about that Jesus. And they're going to try to get you to hold on to your path right. for the rest of your life. They're going to want you to die. I'm here to tell you the gospel says yes. that you're a new creation. Thank you. Hallelujah. The old has passed away. And all things have become new. Hallelujah. If you can believe in that God, he will rise you up. You'll be like cream that comes to the top. I'm Amen. telling you right now, he will make something out of you that you could have never dreamed in a million years. And let me tell you why he does it. Let me tell you why he doesn't do it for the fool who thinks that he has understanding. Let me tell you why he doesn't do it for the self-righteous who thinks that they got something figured out. Because he will not share his glory with another. And the moment that this preacher right here forgets that he was... Oh, Lord, help me. Sitting on an air conditioner outside a convenience store in Lafayette at 17 years old, waiting for somebody to bring some weed so he could smoke some dope. The minute that I forget all of the, oh, man, I was a mess. I got things running through my mind that I can't even say out loud. Mm -hmm. All messed up. All kind of matter of sickness and disease. How in the world can we forget where the Lord brought us from? Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that I was that messed up. Amen. I'm so glad that I was that crippled that I'll never forget where God brought me from. Lord, please don't let me forget. When I look in the mirror and I think that you cleaned something up, Lord, never let me forget what you brought me from. Amen. Amen. My first point was this. He purchased a place. It was called Hebron. It's not just a place of death and burial, but it's also a place of victory. Amen. It's all about the cross. Next thing I want you to know is that it was a purchase price. There was a purchase price. And the word of the Lord, it said it right there in verse 9, that he may give me the cave. We're back in Genesis chapter 23, verse 9. Abraham says that, uh, that he, talking about Ephron, may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a burying place, Amongst you. It, it, you know the fact of the matter is. Is that the gospel teaches. It says in Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Being justified freely. By his grace. Through the redemption. Which is in. Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff right there. I mean you can't just pass that up. We need to stop and, and teach. You know what it means to be justified? Huh? Do you know? It's a declaration. It's a declaration that you've been made righteous. God said it. Amen. Just as if you didn't sin. It doesn't matter how bad you were. It doesn't matter what you did. In the eyes of God, it's just as if you never sinned. And he declares it so. He said it. So what I want to tell you is this. Is that it doesn't matter what other people are saying. God said. Yeah, he ain't never done it. How, how does that work? You've got to put Jesus in your heart. You can't listen to the word of God, walk up out of here, never put Jesus in your heart and think you're okay. No. You got to get the real Jesus in your heart, embrace the eternal plan of God. And when you do that, God says, justify. Yes. And if you will begin to believe what God says about you, that you've now been clothed with the righteousness of the righteous one, now grace is flowing in your life. 
as you continue to believe in God's plan of redemption, and that's really my second point, the purchase price, redemption. It's a price that was paid. Justified freely by his grace. See, they were trying to give Abraham the property for free. Oh, no, you're a prince amongst us. Oh, please, let us give it to you. Justified freely by his grace. In other words, you're not going to earn anything in the eyes of God. The way that you get justified or you get said that you're righteous is by believing in what God has offered. But, but it wasn't just free. There was a purchase price. Redemption. The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the purchase price. Amen. That's your value. That's how God sees you. Amen. The darling of it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I still get so emotional when I really get into the presence of God and I just start thinking about the blood of Jesus. His blood poured out. Amen. His blood, his obedience, his willingness to lay down his life in my place, in the midst of my sin, even though I failed it. Yet while I was a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. The redemption price. Yes. Yeah, and the story is 400 shekels of silver. I'm not worried about that. I'm trying to make a point to you. Abraham said, no, the eternal plan of God is going to require a purchase price. God said he'd give me a people and give me a place. From that people and that place will come forth Messiah. Messiah is going to die on the cross and he's going to shed his blood and he's going to bring a purchase price. Redemption. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. It said it right there in 1 Peter 1.18. I tried to quote it earlier, paraphrasing. You were not redeemed with corruptible things. Redemption. Redeemed. You were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold from the vain traditions that you received from your fathers. But instead the blood, the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundations of the God had a plan in place. Amen. Before it was ever formed, before you were ever right. formed, before you ever walked on this earth. Amen. And it's a plan of redemption. It requires a purchase price. The shedding of blood. Amen. It wasn't free. It cost Jesus his life. That was, that was point number two, purchase price. Point number three, I know, I mean, I ain't never done this before because... Robert used to get on me, but they all start with peace today. <laughs> a purchase perimeter. <laughs> what is a perimeter? It's a line that shows boundaries. Remember in, in, in the end of the story, what did it say? It said all the borders thereof, the trees, all the borders were made sure, it says it twice, made sure in the audience of the children of Heth to make sure that we understand that there's a perimeter here. There's a boundary that's taking place. What I need you to understand is, is that the burial place for God's bride, not only does it provide a place of death, burial, and resurrection and victory, not only did it require a purchase price, the blood of his precious son Jesus, but it also brings about a perimeter. It, 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 it surrounds you and it makes you different than everything else around you. you got to understand that. Listen to me. From that day moving forward, that's the reason it was done in the audience of everybody so that they would know this property right here doesn't belong to the Canaanite. It doesn't belong to the sons of Heth. And it no longer belongs to Ephron the Hittite. This property right here belongs to Abraham. Now listen to me, 200 years later, my son, why can't we buy this pretty piece of property with that nice tomb right there and all these beautiful trees in the field of, in the land of Mamre? No, you can't have it because it belongs to a man named Abraham. He served a different God than what we served. See, what they tried to tell him was this. They said, you're a mighty prince among us. We'll give it to you. See, the word among there means in the middle of, but it also means with us. I don't mean to be rude, sir, but no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not among you. Oh, I might be in the world, but I'm not of the world. Right. See, the truth of the matter is, is that Abraham knew good and well that he wasn't with him. How do you know that? Because all you got to do is read the Bible. All you got to do is read the Bible, and after the flood, what happens? Noah had three sons, did he not? You remember who they were? Shem. Ham, Japheth. Who comes from Ham? Canaan. What did God say about Canaan? Cursed be Canaan. 
Cursed be Canaan. The Canaanite living in the land. Abraham didn't come from Canaan. Abraham came from Shem. The Shemites, the Semites. That's what whenever you hear Fox News talking about Semitic people, that's what they're talking about. Those that come from Shem. What I'm here to tell you is this. Abraham knew that he wasn't of the same father that they were from. Spiritually, what that speaks of is this. Cursed be Canaan. Those are the ones of the world. Those are the ones that will refuse the God that you talk about. Those are the ones that refuse the God that you witness about that changed your life. Cursed be Canaan. Cursed be the world. Not because they were worse than what you were. No. The word of Ephesians says, and such were some of you. Don't forget where you came from. But you believe the eternal plan of God. And when you did, the Holy Ghost showed up. Amen. And he made you different. He put a perimeter around you. He made you different than everybody else that was around you because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. See, just as that cave was a down payment for God's promise for Abraham, and it came to pass. Listen to me. That place is called Israel now. God's promise to Abraham came to pass. And the word of God says in Ephesians 1.13, that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And it's a down payment. When you truly get saved, you know it because the Holy Spirit Amen. moves into your heart. It's a down payment. Amen. And what it's telling you is, is that it's proof to you. Because God's good like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. He wants to prove to you mm -hmm. that it's real. Oh, if you really saved, you won't know it's real. Because yeah. you won't ever be the same. Mm -hmm. And it's a down payment. And just as... Abraham, he didn't see it with his own eyes. He died. He went on with the Lord. He was a cloud of witnesses of Hebrews 11. But, it, but, but this is the thing. It came to pass. And just as the word of God says that when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes live in your heart, it's a down payment until the redemption, meaning until you actually see God with your physical eyes and you, and, mm -hmm. and amen, you become, you receive your glorified body. It's a down payment. It's going to happen. Just as Abraham's purchase turn into the promise, your faith in Christ is going to result in the end, amen, of, 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 the, of the fulfillment of the promise. Amen. But see, I want you to know something. The world, the world wanted to give Abraham the property because the world does not want you to be different than them. Do, do you understand That's that? Right. And, and, and the modern church doesn't want to be different than the rest of the church. Amen. I've been around enough preachers and enough Bible college students to know. So oftentimes, nobody can even think for themselves. The Lord help us. In Christianity, most of the time, we can't even think for ourselves. We sit there, I know, y'all feel like I'm beating you up because I am not even really talking to you, man. You're, you're the people I love. Y'all are here, man. We're together. We're on the same team. We're under the banner. Amen. I'm trying to make a point, though. Amen. I'm trying to make a point, though, that in this big old thing called Christianity, people can't even think for themselves. The preachers are regurgitating the same information that they got from their buddy. Yeah. And Lord help you if somebody comes along and actually opens up the book and starts to read something besides John Maxwell's book on leadership. Oh Lord, don't get me started on that. And actually starts finding out what the Bible says about leadership. Amen. And actually finds out what how Jesus led, which is completely contrary to the leadership of the world, by the way. Yeah. In case you hadn't noticed that. Amen. Lord, help us if you start opening up the Bible and you actually start reading what it is that it says. The world doesn't want you to look different. The world wants to absorb you. Amen. That's why they don't want Abraham paying for that piece of property. Let us give it to you. Mm -hmm. And then after you go away, after you go on to sleep with your fathers, we can just absorb you. See, your presence brings conviction in the life of the world. That's right. I'm telling you right now. Wow. Whenever you start telling people... You know, they're like, oh, no, we're the same. I've been having a conversation with some dude at the gym for a while now. He's trying to convince me what he's saying. Mm -hmm. We ain't the same, dude. You have another spirit. Mm -hmm. You got a lying spirit in you. It's telling you that the Bible, the whole Bible isn't the word of God. That is not the same spirit that lives in me. Amen. You, you, you got a spirit in you that's telling you that the strength and the power is in you. No, I'm done with that. This, this conversation's over. I'm not even spending any more time on it. Next time you're ready to really hear the word, good. Come talk to me. We'll talk yeah. about it. 
But listen to me. The problem is, is that have you ever, do you, do you know what that, that's what Jesus meant? When he said, don't cast your pearl before swine. Yeah. Do you realize that? Yeah. Does that sound harsh to you? Because I didn't say it. Jesus said That's right. It. Don't cast your pearl before swine. Do you realize? You know, I, wonder, I want you to understand something. I've done spent hours on the phone with this person before. Hours. It's not like I didn't try. Mm -hmm. But whenever you start to talk to somebody and they already got all the answers figured out in their own mind. Mm -hmm. And you think, you think you're going to sit there and persuade them and talk them into it. At some point in time, it's kind of like, you know what, the seed of the sower? Amen. Jesus talked about it like it was a pearl, too. It's a pearl of great price. It's a treasure. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're it's just slinging pearls up in a hog pit. Mm -hmm. you, 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 know what a, you know what a hog thinks about a pearl? Mm -hmm. Just stomping on it, shoving it in the mud while its snotty snout is looking for some more slop to eat. I know that sounds harsh, but that's exactly what happens. That's what they think about the word. They, 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 they got something figured out. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that your presence in the midst of the world brings conviction in people's lives. Amen. Preaching like this, if you ain't right with God, will bring conviction in the midst of your life. Amen. All you got to do is come to the realization you aren't okay. That's right. Amen. But that Jesus can make you. Right. Amen. Amen.